Hi, I'm Patricia Greenberg. Today, my guest is Dr. Jeannie Greco. She is a dentist, a biological dentist, which we're going to talk about. Uh, what is that and how does that differ from traditional dentistry? Um, Jeannie, I'm so happy to have you. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So I asked you to come on the show because I, I want to be your partner in educating the public you know, on how important it is to take care of our oral health, especially as we age. You know, we do focus on aging on this show, but again, these are things I find whether we're aging or we're younger or middle age, wherever you fall in that spectrum, it's important to take care of your teeth. We all know that, especially from starting at a young age. And, in, in you know, I, I want everybody also to just let go of what, of what you've done in the past. Don't worry about what you didn't do, what you did do. And let's just get started today on good oral health. So, you know, first of all, I just want to mention, I met Dr. Jeannie Greco at a conference that I was attending, and uh, it's always wonderful for me to learn new things. You know, I'm 62, and she's young enough to be my daughter, this beautiful young woman going out in the world doing great things. So I just want to encourage you when these things come along, whether it's health, wellness, habits, um, you know, just things you want to do that are for fun or learn about how trees grow, get out there and learn because that's the only way we're going to stay well and take care of ourselves. So tell us how you became a dentist. Sure. Um, again, thank you so much for having me. We are totally aligned regarding educating the public on oral health. Um, it really is my mission as much as it is yours to help people gain control of their health status and feel empowered with the knowledge that I'm going to share with you today. Um, but a little bit about my background. So I am, it's actually pretty interesting how I came of being, you know, becoming a dentist. So my father actually is an OBGYN and I always felt very drawn to the type of care that he provided, um, being very compassionate and extremely dedicated. And that always resonated with me. Um, I would, you know, go with him to his office hours on the weekends and round with him at the hospitals. And I was always just very taken aback by, um, how amazing it was to have that um, exchange with people and just be able to take care of them and, you know, their new child. Um, but, uh, you know, opposite of that, my mother was not in healthcare. She is an artist and she um, is in textiles and fashion. And that was something that always, you know, fascinated me growing up, just seeing her work with her hands and design and the artistry of everything um, that she did. So I, Originally, so I went to Syracuse University and I was there studying for the MCAT and I just knew it wasn't clicking. I knew there was something off that it maybe wasn't the right path for me. And that at that point is when I realized that I really should talk to some of my extended family who are dentists. And I'm really lucky in that they saw the natural fit it was for me, knowing my background and knowing the type of person I am. And after shadowing them, I, I really fell in love. Um, they say dentist is actually stands for the, the word dentist stands for doctor, engineer, and artist. So I oh. really felt like that meant the most, it really was very apropos for me. Absolutely. Um, That's a great acronym. That's funny. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Um, so then I went on to NYU and I completed a residency at Northwell, um, which is a big, you know, very well-known hospital system in, in New York. Um, and in my, the end of my first year, they actually selected me to stay as chief resident which at the time is obviously a very big honor. And when it's offered to you, you really take advantage of that opportunity. And I was able to stay and train the first year residents and do more complex dental cases. Um, but my, you know, my training, of course, didn't end there. I began working with Dr. Jerry Curatola, who is a pioneer in the biological um, world, both medically and dentally. And I'm very lucky to have learned from him and to now practice with him every day. So uh, we're going to get to the core of all that, but could you explain explain biologic dentistry as opposed to conventional? I don't know if it's an either or, but maybe give us a little insight into that. Sure. So biologic dentistry is a way of practicing denti dentistry that treats the root cause. We try to look at someone's overall health status without ignoring certain things that might be going on with them systemically that could have an impact and on their oral health status or vice versa. Um, I really do try to treat patients from 
that standpoint, as opposed to being the sort of drill em, fill em, bill em dentist that doesn't take the time to really delve deeper. You know, we all know the mouth is the gateway to your digestive health as well as the rest of your body. I've always believed that. Um, so talk to us about the function of your teeth, your tongue, your gums, and, you know, how and when they are compromised, like how does it affect the rest of your body? Sure. So the function of your teeth and your tongue and your gums are obviously paramount to proper digestion. And it's not only taste and chewing and salivation, but those are the primary steps to digesting, digesting your food properly. So when that is lost, you can no longer break down foods and absorb nutrients or nourish your body the way you really need to be. Um, so it first really starts with a healthy oral microbiome. We know the microbes in our mouth, that there are good bacteria and there are bad bacteria. Um, and certain bad bacteria can cause um, gum disease or decay or just, in fact, having a lower pH in your mouth can cause issues with your digestive tract. So it, the, it, it sounds obvious that we should try to save our teeth as much as possible. Um, but why is that? Because um, is the, are the new materials, we're going to talk about that a little bit also. But, you know, if our own teeth are going, why should we keep them? I know it sounds like a stupid question, but I'm curious about that. No, it's, it's not a stupid question at all. Yeah. Um, you know, the importance of keeping your teeth and keeping your whole mouth healthy, you know, your teeth are connected to your bones, which are, you know, covered and protected by your gums. The whole um, part of that is that you, um, sorry, the whole point of that to keep that healthy is to prevent further disease from happening. For example, something that's really a problem is the correlation between diabetes or heart disease. And we are finding now that there is a direct correlation between gum disease and even Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So really taking care of your mouth is very important. Now, as we age, do you see the same signs of aging inside the mouth as you do outside on the skin and hair? deterioration, um, atrophy, those type of things that, that you see with uh, on the outside as well as on the inside? We do. We do see the same type of aging. We can see loss of enamel, which can wear away as we age, whether that's through wear, normal wear and tear, acidic foods, or even grinding. But we can also lose the bone around our teeth, which can cause gum recession. And these are all preventable by regular dental visits. So let's get back to basics. Um, how often should we see the dentist? So generally speaking, I recommend a cleaning every three to four months, once a season, give or take. Um, it takes that amount of time for the bad bacteria to, or plaque or calculus to really accumulate in the mouth and adhere to the teeth and cause destruction to the gums. Um, an exam can happen two times a year where the dentist actually goes in and really does you know, a thorough exam on every part of the mouth. That's really an insurance-driven construct. Um, I really like to keep an eye on my patients, even if they're just coming in for their regular cleanings, they may not be due for an exam, but I still like to put my eyes on them regardless, mm -hmm. just to make mm -hmm. sure I'm not missing anything. Um, but you know, it's very important, especially as we age, when medical histories become a little bit more complex or medical statuses, I should say, become a little bit more complex. So in short, you really should try to come to the dentist as often as once a season. And what are you checking for besides the health of the teeth and gums? Like, let's go down the list of what would can be a problem aside from just the aesthetics. Sure. So first things first, I ask about their medical history every time they're in. Any changes, anything new? There's such an intimate correlation between someone's medical history and their dental status. And sometimes the patient might not understand why I ask, but it really is first and foremost to keep them safe and also for me to understand what could be going on in their mouth. Um, then I physically check, you know, I look in the entire mouth, the gum, the soft palate, the tongue, under the tongue, inner portion of the teeth, really everything. Um, early detection for anything, not just oral cancer, is absolutely incredible at preventing disease. For example, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is very much on the rise and can be screened for easily in the dental chair. Um, I look at certain anatomical issues, like maybe does the patient have a narrow jaw? Do they have a high vaulted palate? Do they have a tongue tie or dental crowding? These are important to screen for because sleep apnea undetected can cause a multitude of systemic issues, including thyroid dysregulation, hormone imbalance, and so much more. 
Um, then, of course, I check x-rays for anything that could be going on that's not obvious to the naked eye, um, you know, really between the teeth and the bone levels and anything that could be abnormal. Um, I also, you know, because we are a biologic practice, I highly recommend a patient have a CT scan done. It's actually called a cone beam CT done, you know, every, even every few years, just to screen for any pathology that could be happening inside the jaw to avoid any old root canal infections or to avoid any areas where bone could be diseased and causing an issue with them systemically. That's very interesting. I've never had that recommended to me uh, to have a cat. Is that something you offer in the office or they need to go to a radiology office for that? We do offer them in the office, but for any patients that are actually from out of town, which is a, a large portion of our patient base, we can accept and read CT scans from a radiology practice, but we prefer to take them in our, in our office. Amazing. So I want to talk about the stuff that we always worry about, the aesthetics, like my teeth are yellowing or I feel like, you know, uh, my teeth don't look as good anymore. So what contributes to the discoloration of the teeth? We automatically assume it's staining. But I imagine there's right. other stuff going on there. Right. Of course, you're correct. I mean, of course, the main offense is what we're consuming. It could be coffee, tea, red wine, chocolate, the usual suspects. Mm -hmm. But sometimes a patient says to me, you know, I really try to avoid these things or I really try to take good care. And, you know, I'm really up on my oral hygiene, but I'm noticing that my teeth are becoming, you know, darker. And a lot of that could be wear of the enamel. The enamel wears as we get older and it exposes the inner portion of the tooth or the dentin layer, which is darker than the enamel. This can wear for several reasons, obviously normal function, but there could be a drop in the pH of the mouth, meaning that it's more acidic and can erode the enamel. This can be due to a multitude of reasons for mouth breathing, or like I said, sleep apnea, or if there is a disturbance in the gut that's lowering the pH of someone's oral microbiome. So um, this interesting about enamel erosion, do you find, because when I get my teeth clean, the hygienist says to me, do you eat grapefruit or do you, and I don't, I mean, is that a real, is, are there real foods you absolutely should stay away from that cause erosion of the, of the enamel? You know, yes and no. I, I have found that everybody has different, sort of a different makeup, right? Some people have really thick enamel. Some people have really thin enamel. Everybody is very different. So when I see someone physically and, and, see, and ask them about what their diet might include, it's very personalized. Somebody might be, you know, drinking hot water with lemon every single morning and their teeth look completely fine. Their enamel is nice and thick, but it's really a case by case basis and, and delving a little bit deeper into their medical status, if they are someone who is diabetic, if they are someone who is, you know, maybe going through menopause, these are all things that can cause someone to run a little bit more on the aesthetic side. So um, I want to talk about the things we all dread. That's the root canals, the caps, veneers, and worst case scenario or dentures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I know that that's a lot, that's a, that's a loaded question, but if we could just go over that a little bit, um, particularly root canals, caps and cavities, you know, how, how those are treated. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very good question because it's a lot of the fear of the unknown, right. but I would start with materials at large, you know, historically patients were having, or, you know, the public, I should say was having silver fillings, which are amalgam fillings and they're um, an amalgam that are made of 52% mercury and the remaining portion is usually, you know, silver, tin and other low nobility metals. Um, you know, they were used so commonly because you can use them in a wet environment. You didn't, you know, if someone had a lot of saliva or if it was hard to keep someone's mouth dry while working on them, it was easy and it's cheap and easy to obtain. And, you know, we've obviously found over the years that they are problematic and can cause certain, you know, neuro, neuro toxic issues that, you know, whether the research is able to button up or not, the ADA is actually now recommending that they are no longer placed in pregnant women or children, or at least a very reduced amount. Um, so it, the paradigm is shifting. But second to fillings, you know, metal crowns were also commonly used, which are, are becoming more and more obsolete, but they were an issue at the time, specifically because they are also made of low nobility metal, including nickel, which we know as, you know, women commonly nickel allergies were an issue with earrings and things like that. So why would it be okay to have in your mouth? I have found with, um, you know, 
a grand majority of the population, the gum tissue around a, meta, a metal crown is usually quite inflamed. Um, but then lastly, of course, titanium implants have been widely pop popular and generally successful. But again, the paradigm is shifting away from metals. So we now use porcelain when restoring the teeth, whether they be fillings, onlays, which are a certain type of filling, crowns, veneers, and ceramic implants. They are much more what we call bioinert, or they're much more stable in the mouth and cause less inflammation. And actually, interestingly enough, don't allow plaque to adhere to them as well as metals were because oh, they're much is, less. Yeah, that's a real plus. That's fantastic. Yes. Yes. Um, let me jump in just for a second on this. So now um, I am 62. I'm really lucky. I've only had three cavities my whole life. But I originally had the mercury, the you know, 1968 or whatever it was when I was a little kid. And then I had a dentist take them out. And then my new dentist, who I've been known for 30 years now, told me you should never have had them taken out. That's worse than leaving them in. What's your thoughts on that? It's a very hot topic, but I would say that if you should have them taken out, and I generally speaking, usually are on the side of having them removed because they were placed without a, a chemical bond in the tooth. They were placed with a mechanical bond, meaning the shape of the, the way that they were fit into the tooth. And that can cause decay to happen around them. It can, they can expand and contract and cause certain pressure on certain cusps that eventually can cause cracking in the teeth. Not all of them, if they were really tiny, maybe not a problem, but I don't really recommend people keep them in their mouth, obviously because they can have decay around them if they happen to, or because we have found that they off gas when you chew, when you have something hot, if you're someone who grinds your teeth, they are known to off gas mercury with time. Now, everybody's different. Some people have a way higher tolerance and ability to detox that mercury, but some people do not and some people suffer for it. So if you need them taken out, which I always recommend a full thorough exam before doing that. You should have it done safely. We have a very robust protocol that we use to make sure that neither you, myself, or the assistant are exposed to copious amounts of mercury during the procedure. So um, just a, kind of a, a nitpick question, but it's of interest to me. So you have mm -hmm. a cavity filled with mercury as a child, and then you get older. That could be 50 years later, 30 years later even, and then there's a crack or a dec or or a decay, you'll still leave the original tooth intact. You'll just take everything out and replace it with a ceramic filling. Yes, huh? yes. Usually I can. Um, you know, you obviously have to remove any portion of the tooth that also has decay around it because that's yes. diseased tooth structure. But we use a multitude of materials in our practice to help you know maintain the integrity of that tooth structure and also replace that missing portion with something that is as least toxic as possible. Okay. Let's talk about the horrible, because I had one root canal. Tell us about root canals. What are they? And sure. why do we need them? <laughs> so root canals were considered to be very, very successful. If you were in, you know, a position where you did not want to lose your tooth. Um, and they our procedure where, you know, an endodontist or a general dentist can go inside the tooth and take out the nerve um, bundle and the blood supply. And the thought was to completely sterilize it and fill it with a material that is, um, again, also bioinert. But the reality is, is the tooth not only has a, a main nerve canal, it has thousands and thousands of lateral canals or accessory canals that can also be a source of bacteria. Um, I'm very careful with who I recommend having a root canal or who I don't recommend, depending on the level of infection um, and whether or not it will be successful. But generally speaking, root canals are seen as something of a temporary fix because they tend to fail with time. If they're done really, really well, then wonderful. We have to take a CT scan on them every few years to make sure that the integrity of them remains. But you have to look at the whole picture. If someone has a chronic illness, if they have heart disease, if they have diabetes, we have to make sure that their C-reactive protein is not elevated uh -huh, uh -huh. because, and this is something that is across the board, you know, it is a biological concept, but it is something that I was taught many, many years ago in, dent in dental school, that if someone's C-reactive protein is spiking and they have a root canal that might be failing, you have to consider having it taken out. 
Okay. And t- tell us just real quickly about what C-reactive protein is and how it's a marker for heart disease. Sure. C-reactive protein is something that is um, uh, it's a marker that is used to see how, you know the level of kidney function and if it is taxed in any way that could be causing an issue with you know heart function or your ability to reduce the amount of inflammation in your body. Okay. And uh, so that is, um, that's really innovative that your dentist would be looking for that, right? That's not something that yeah. historically dentists look for in the past. So uh, I want to have one more question. It's kind of a personal question because I had it done and then we're going to go on to orthodonture because I have a lot of questions about that as well. So I had some gum recession in my back molars and they he filled it in. So he filled it in with ceramic to actually make my tooth wider. Um, Mm -hmm. and I've been fine ever since. So I want to ask about gums bleeding. We hear so much. Well, sometimes it just bleeds because you floss too hard or it's because you're in menopause. What is the level of seriousness about when your gums are bleeding and and what do we look for? Um, I I would always go and see the dentist if that was happening, but what's a serious thing to look for with gum bleeding? Sure. So I find there to be no scenario where there's a level of bleeding that is acceptable. Okay. I think that that is a that is a you know a marker and a diagnostic measure for an inflammatory process to be happening in real time. And if there's anything that we can do to mitigate that, whether it means that the let's say someone has a crown that's a little too bulky and is a little too hard for a patient to maintain with good brushing and flossing and water picking, then you have to consider having it redone. Um, You know, there are scenarios where bleeding is a sign of health, maybe after an extraction, but generally speaking, routine bleeding is not okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So get get over to the dentist if you find that your gums are bleeding. If How about if it's periodic? Sometimes you might be flossing and you see a little blood spot, but then it goes away. You know, you want to make sure that it goes away. It's, it's okay. It's really not okay, but if you do find that it is periodic and maybe, you know, in correlation with any sort of hormonal imbalance, or if you're running a little stressed, sure, that could absolutely be a reason for why, but you generally speaking want to know that it goes, want to help yourself in seeing the dentist, but also in in helping it go away. So moving on, we always um, looked at orthodonture as you had to get, go to the orthodontist and get your teeth straightened because it doesn't look nice. And now we know there's so much more to that than than just the aesthetics of it. So tell us about crowding and spacing teeth and some of the, you know, what you, you know, what you need to correct in the case of teeth that are misaligned or crooked or missing. Sure. So this is another concept where we really come from a root cause standpoint. Um, dental crowding is usually indicative of a greater issue that could be going on. I hinted a little bit, uh, you know, before about sleep apnea, but that is becoming something that we screen for routinely, no matter how old someone might be. When I see someone who has dental crowding, that is a red flag for a developmental, you know, um, developmental, uh, let me, let me reword this. When I see dental crowding, that is usually indicative of, of a de- you know, a deficiency or an inability to develop properly or completely. It mm-hmm. usually means that there is an airway deficiency, okay. meaning that the jaws are not developing wide enough for the volume of air that someone might need. So when I see that there is crowding, I usually recommend a sleep study. And that is something that can be done in the comfort of their own home. It is an at-home, you know, wristwatch that it. it connected to an app and our our sleep dentist will be able to read the results after just one night of sleep. And that is usually much more organic than having it done in a sleep study where, you know, you're you're just not in your normal environment. Mm -hmm. Um, So once we see those results, we can decide if someone would benefit from clear aligner therapy or would they, you know, benefit from something called a DNA appliance, which is something that is similar to a palate expander. Um, and that's usually the approach we take when we see crowding and not just, you know, let's just do, you know, braces or Invisalign to correct it because there might be a greater issue underlying. Good to know. And is that something you provide in your office? Is that a, a, like, is, is a dentist one-stop shopping? Because I know there's 
the orthodontist, and I know a lot of dentists now are doing Invisalign and um, treating sleep apnea in their office. So um, is it safe to say that someone can go to their regular general doctor and have these this stuff checked out? Sure. I would say that it is a one-stop shop concept. You know, if there is a dentist who provides these services in their office, then generally speaking, everything can be taken care of in one location. Um, I, you know, I want to ask you, I'm going to be the definitive person on what is the best routine for us to do at home. Things like, do we brush twice a day? Do we brush every time we eat? Do we floss every time we eat? Electric versus a handheld. Tell us, tell us the rundown of what we need to do at home to take care of our teeth. Sure. Mm -hmm. So the best routine, in my opinion, is brushing with an electric toothbrush. I don't like what I see on patients' teeth when they are doing the traditional, you know, back and forth with a handheld manual toothbrush. It's, it's not as effective as an electric toothbrush, which can just get into more nooks and crannies um, than a manual brush. But starting with an electric toothbrush with a soft toothbrush head is the, you know, starting point. Okay. And then I would recommend flossing and then water picking. Okay. And I recommend, and it's funny enough, most patients say, you know, are you sure? Is that really overkill? Do I need to water pick if I'm already brushing and flossing? And the answer is yes, because it's a massage for the gums and it really promotes good blood, blood flow. Um, but, you know, funny enough, I always recommend that they actually use it in the shower so that yeah. they can, A, spend a little more time in the shower and then B, avoid the mess. Yeah, it's a big mess. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and you, uh, you don't recommend uh, mouthwash? No, I actually don't. And that's a common, you know, misconception. Uh, typical mouthwashes like, you know, Scope and Listerine, they generally speaking have a high content of alcohol in them. Um, and that can cause, you know, there have been studies that have shown that there is an incre increased risk for oral cancer if you're using mouthwashes with alcohol in them every day. Um, so I usually recommend to avoid if possible, if someone has an issue with, you know, with their breath or if they really want to feel that super clean afterwards, there are other things that we, we can do and that I recommend it instead. Okay. You know, I didn't, I know we had a little pre-discussion about what we were going to talk about and I didn't ask you about gum. What's your, what's your, what's your feeling about chewing gum? So chewing gum, it, it's interesting. So there are some really great benefits to chewing gum. Salivation and keeping the teeth bathed in your own saliva is super important at you know, reducing decay and potentially gum disease. But the only downside that I find to gum is that it can really cause some issues with the TMJ and, and some inflammatory issues with time that can cause clicking, popping, you know, problems with the joint specifically that may or may not lead to an arthritic joint. But that is something that I say, don't do it regularly. If you're someone who really likes to chew gum, you know, don't do it quite often, maybe once here and there. But um, the, the TMJ disorder is really where I have an issue with chewing gum. And do you recommend it on the go? Like, you know, sometimes I take it with me when I'm flying, if I have like a five or six hour flight, and it's really not conducive to brushing your teeth on an airplane. Um, right. So uh, I might take like yeah. the the white cleaning gum. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to, and I don't do it with any, That's fine. like once every couple That's of fine. months. Of I have no issue with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. let's talk about the toothpaste, toothpaste, first of all, what kind should we be using? There's a thousand on the market and other products mm -hmm. and materials that, you know, are used in the dentist's office and what to look for. Sure. So when it comes to toothpaste specifically, if you're looking for a toothpaste in like the, you know, toothpaste aisle of the pharmacy, I would highly recommend avoiding sodium lauryl sulfate as it can really disturb the oral microbiome. Fluoride is also something that I generally avoid as I have seen firsthand, effect, you know, the damaging effects of fluorosis on children's teeth. They can become dark, stained, and brittle and allow for what we call hidden decay to flourish and become extremely hard to detect. Um, I actually recommend Revitin as a toothpaste. It is practically an oral supplement. It is loaded with silica, CoQ10, and sea buckthorn oil, vitamin E, and K2, and D3, and, and you know many other wonderful things. But it really is very effective at preventing decay and reducing gingival inflammation because it balances the oral microbiome. So what about whitening? Um, because I, you know, the, a lot of the the commercial toothpaste claim to be whitening or whitening strips. Um, what what's the download down low on that? 
So I would avoid things like crest white strips or things that you can buy over the counter in the pharmacy because they have found to have damaging effects on the gum tissues. I would really recommend having a whitening done in a dental office specifically because we use certain materials and, you know, have a certain method where we really, really protect the gums um, and we can help support you post, you know, whitening with certain recommendations in terms of foods to avoid, things to add to your diet and, you know, to really guide you through that process rather than potentially damaging or harming your teeth at home. So what should we be doing to be proactive, like in our own oral care education, besides listening to the show, uh, medication, surgery, whatever it may be, you know, what's your go-to to learn about what it is we should and shouldn't be doing for our oral health? That's a really great question. I would say that the most important thing that I would do, and regardless of what you're looking for in uh, a dental practice, my biggest recommendation would be to at least go to the dentist more often. I think it's important that the more often you go to the dentist, you learn more and see more, and you have someone watching you and, and examining you more often, whether it be the dentist or the hygienist. Okay. It's super important to gain control of and feel empowered by the knowledge that you might learn when you're there, whether that is you know, is there a little stain on your tooth that we're watching closely, you know, with a little camera, I can take a picture of a tooth and, and examine it and see the changes of it every three to four months. Or when the hygienist measures the gums, is there any inflammation that could be happening in a shorter period of time rather than just the, once every six months or once every year that sometimes patients reduce their um, recall to. I think it's important to, you know, go to the dental office more often and it does not have to be super costly. It does not have to be super time consuming, but the more you do it, the more you learn and become empowered. And um, the way it affects the rest of your entire body, that's, that's the first step. That's what, you know, yeah. we've been saying all along is get your teeth checked, get your oral health in place. Right. It has a very beneficial exactly. effect on the rest of your body. And Absolutely. specifically because dentists are on the front line. We are the first, um, you know, gatekeeper basically of someone who can manage your, yes, your oral health, but see what could be going on that might lead me to believe that there is an issue going on systemically. If there's inflammation in your gums, when was the last time your hemoglobin A1C was checked? Mm -hmm. Or if there is an, an, an issue with um, dry mouth, are you on a lot of medications and maybe is it time to tweak them? You mm -hmm. know, it's continually staying on top of your overall health, not just your oral status. Dr. Greco, what is your take on alternative medicine, chiropractic, acupuncture, vitamin therapy, naturopathic, homeopathic? I know the list is endless and there's a lot of hokey stuff out there, but I'm curious to hear how you feel about it. So I'm actually a huge believer in alternative medicine. Um, funny story, my great grandfather was actually one of the first chiropractors in New York State. Wow. And he published the first, the very first textbook on chiropractic adjustments. So I greatly believe in the power of chiropractic to promote the longevity of your spine and your overall orthopedic health. Um, but it's more than that. I really do believe in acupuncture, lymphatic massage. Um, and of course, supplementation, I think is incredibly important because our diet is so deficient. Um, and I do believe in naturopathic medicine, as I really have been lucky enough to know and see some of the greatest naturopaths change lives of people who really could not find success with tradition with the traditional medical model. So as much as I will always, you know, believe in conventional medicine and the success that it has had in it helping promote longevity, it needs to be done in a way where there's a good balance and helping people live not just longer, but healthier lives. Dr. Jeannie Greco, I can't thank you enough for coming here. This was just so informative. And you know what? I'm going to have you back because I think there's a lot more to talk about as much as we try yes. to cover all the, all the topics. Um, but you know, in short, everybody get out there, try to get to the dentist every three to four months throughout the year. Every season, I like the way you put that. At the start of every season, go. And that way, it's kind of like a marker to see how you're doing with everything. Lastly, Dr. Greco, what do you like about getting older? What do I like about getting older? So there are so many things I love about getting older. Firstly, I have to say that um, really the confidence that it has given me is, you know, just by simply having more lived experiences and meeting more people and traveling more um, has helped me become more um, sure of myself and confident in my mission. 
Um, but I also, I, I've also become so much more passionate and sure of myself as I continue to see life as it is around me. Good. And I hope that continues for you. And thank you again so much for joining us. Stay well and stay safe. I'm Patricia Greenberg. And I want all of you out there to eat well, live well, and age well. And if you have any more questions about today's show or to get in touch with Dr. Jeannie Greco, you can get in touch with us here at www.patriciagreenberg.com. Thank you all. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure.